Hello everyone. This lecture that I am going to give today on the relaxation spectrum for bituminous binders is a continuation of the lecture which Professor Murli Krishnan uh, gave it to you all maybe during I think the third week of this course. Uh, basically, people are trying to identify different techniques, different parameters to characterize the rheological response of this material. All along the lecture, uh, here and there we have mentioned that it is very difficult to group binders which will have identical rheological response. Say for example, let us take two bituminous binders of the same grade. Let us say VG30 grade which we are very commonly exposed to. Now if I take two VG30 bitumen and try to characterize the rheological response, we get uh, uh, you know, a whole variety of responses. Sometimes we get identical, sometimes there is no relation between the two of them. People have also tried to use chemical composition based information to characterize the rheological response. So here what people do is identify some components. Say for example, people try to identify the SARA fractions and then try to group the material based on identical percentages of these constituents. Or people try to um, calculate the asphalt and content. Right? There are different techniques that have been attempted. The basic interest here is trying to identify some parameter based on which we can group bitumen, which will exhibit identical rheological response. So in this regard, relaxation spectrum is another tech, another parameter, I could say, uh, which is recently probed into to characterize the rheological response for bituminous binders. So in this uh, next 30 or 40 minute lecture, I will be talking to you about the fundamentals associated with relaxation spectrum. I am not going to get into the details, the deeper aspects of the mathematical part involved in this. I'll basically tell you what is relaxation spectrum, how to compute it for bitumen. And then towards the end of this lecture, I'll show you a case study from a paper which we have published recently in Mechanics of Time Dependent Materials. So in that paper, we have tried different techniques to characterize the response and also used relaxation spectrum. We have seen certain uh, interesting uh, revelations using this relaxation spectrum, which we have not seen using other techniques. So that will be the agenda for the next 30 or 40 minutes. So to begin with, what is this relaxation spectrum? Right? I will give you a very simple broad outline. Let us talk from the polymer perspective. Right? Let us take a polymer. Um, basically, I can take a simple polyethylene, which has different uh, CH2 units. Right? Basically, our polyethylene is n number of CH2 units. So, let us take this polyethylene. Now, when I apply a stress to this material, how is it going to relax my stresses? Right? That is what we are interested in. So, there are many mechanisms which can happen in this material. The first could be uh, simply a rotation of bond or relaxation of the bond. Right, the rotation of the bond through which the stresses could be relaxed. So that is that is one um, one um, relaxation mechanism. Let us take a CH bond which is present in this material. Um, let us say, let us define um, polyethylene as CH two. Right, so we have n units of this CH two. Now, uh, I am basically interested in identifying the first mechanism, which is a CH bond here, right? So there could be rotation of this CH bond here, right? So this rotation of CH bond could be one relaxation mechanism. Now, uh, the other relaxation mechanisms could be segmental relaxation. Let us take a segment of molecule, say for example, between two nodes or between two cross-linked parts. So some uh, segment of this molecule. So let us take this particular segment. So this segment can undergo a certain relaxation. It is not necessary that the whole molecule has to relax. A particular segment of the molecule can relax and that is called as a segmental relaxation. The other mechanism could be the whole molecule. Let us say we have this particular molecule here. right? So there are uh, two molecules and basically all of this applies to large macromolecules. What do we call as macromolecules? Some repeating unit repeating for n a number of times where this n is much, much larger. Right? That is what we call as a macromolecule, a big molecule. So the molecular chain is also very big here. So let us take this particular chain. This particular chain can also move around. 
right? It can do a lot of motions because of which stresses could relax. Um, like that, we can define many mechanisms. In the subsequent slide, I'll also tell you what is reptation. So many different mechanisms might be possible. And if you take a simple polyethylene, which has only one constituent, it can have multiple relaxation mechanisms. But if you look at it, not all relaxation mechanisms will be equally predominant. Maybe a few of them will be very dominant. A few of them will be very subtle that it will be like insignificant, right? So uh, in a particular um, in a particular constituent, you can have multiple relaxation modes with some of them having major predominance, some of them um, very little or towards insignificant level. So then we can imagine a multi-constituent material like bitumen. If we try to apply the same logic to bitumen, we can see that uh, we have a lot of constituents in it, each having multiple relaxations. So what we are getting is a cumulative effect of different, uh, the responses of individual constituents. Now, um, now we'll go to the um, next slide, which talks about the relaxation uh, mapping. Let us take this particular frequency map, uh, which talks about different relaxation modes in the material. What is the frequency range and which technique could capture these relaxation modes? Say, for example, uh, let us, uh, let's first understand this frequency range, right? The frequency range varies from 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power 14 hertz, right? So uh, basically, we are interested in the mechanical relaxation. There are many other relaxation methods available here. Uh, let, us not, let us not worry about all of them. We are only worried about the mechanical relaxation. So the frequency range for this mechanical relaxation is 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power 4 hertz. So basically, when you convert into time, we will be having uh, 100 seconds to 10 to the power minus 4 seconds, right? Uh, modes which relax in this time range, right? Wherein the relaxation, the time taken for them to move or do whatever movement and come to an equilibrium state, right? So the times associated here, that we are capturing in a mechanical relaxation is from 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power plus 2. So that is the range we are capturing. Now, what are all the modes contributing to this relaxation mechanism? So if you look at here, we have different modes associated. The first one is chain dynamics. So what is this chain dynamics? It is basically explained using a Rouse model. Uh, maybe yeah, I have it in the next slide. What is meant by a Rouse model? Uh, it is basically explained using a bead and a spring. So we can see here, we have uh, we have beads at these points, and then we also have springs here. These beads can undergo Brownian movement. Basically, you know, they can just move randomly around. And this spring will provide elasticity to the material. So this is used to explain the flow behavior of an amorphous material. I'll come back to it. So that is the first mechanism that is explained here. The second mechanism is structural relaxation or the alpha process. This is basically nothing but a segmental relaxation. Uh, previously, I was telling you that a particular segment of a molecule can relax, right? So that we call as a segmental relaxation. That is the alpha process. We also have secondary relaxations, which is the movement of the whole molecule, but it is only at a particular point. Let us say we have a big molecule extending over a range. The whole molecule will move, but it is only a localized movement, right? That is called as a secondary relaxation. And we have a fast relaxation mechanism, different things. So all the three, the chain dynamics, the structural relaxation, and the secondary relaxation are possible uh, to be captured in our mechanical relaxation. Now let's uh, talk about the mechanical relaxation for an amorphous material. Right, so uh, it uh, the uh, the I'll first explain the plot, and then we will go into the state of the material. This plot is nothing but log of log g of t versus t. What is this g of t? It is nothing but the relaxation modulus. How do we compute the relaxation modulus? Earlier we have learned about a stress relaxation experiment. So what is this stress relaxation experiment? We apply a constant strain and hold it there. Right, we apply a constant strain over some uh, time period. So during that time, the stresses will begin to relax. Right. So we compute the stress. We divide it by the strain amplitude that we are applying, the constant strain amplitude that we are applying. And what we get is the relaxation modulus. So this is how the relaxation modulus varies with 
time. So basically, we are trying to study the uh, responses at different time scales. So at very low time scales, so this is of the, of the order of 10 to the power 0. Right? Of the, uh, at very low time scales, we can see that this material exhibits a glassy response. Right, Glassy response as in it's very stiff, solid behavior. Then there is a transition region. If you probe it at longer times, basically you load it for longer time, uh, it, it exhibits a rubber rubbery behavior. Okay, then if you further provide longer loading times, it is going to exhibit, it's basically going to flow. Right, so this is the response of an amorphous material at different time scales. Now, what is the mechanism associated with it? It is quite well studied for simple polymers. Basically, they say the segmental relaxation is the mechanism uh, for in associated in this in this region. And then we, we move on to the uh, rubbery state. So the transition from this state to the rubbery state is because of these rouse modes. Uh, basically, the movement, the Brownian movement of these beads and the elasticity associated with the spring. And then we move to the terminal response, which is the flow behavior. This is because of the reptation. So what is this reptation motion? It is, uh, it is as defined by its name. It, it does kind of a movement like this, right? This is explained using a tubular model, wherein you have a big macromolecule. Let's say uh, it is not one single chain like this. It's basically my molecule here. So this macromolecule will not expand or will not move randomly, but the whole molecule is going to move around like this kind of reptate, right? So that is what we see here. It is going to move like inside a tube. So that is why people use a tubular model to explain this reptation motion. So you can see it is a movement of the whole molecule. That is when we get the flow behavior. Okay, so this is how an amorphous material behaves uh, at different time scales. People have also uh, used a, a similar explanation for variation in response with temperature as well. So this is, uh, uh, this is the kind of relaxation mode. So we can see here that it is the same material, but at different uh, time periods, you can see that if you probe it at lower time periods, we have a segmental relaxation. If you move it to higher time periods, we are going to have reptation. So for the same material, depending on the loading time that we apply to the material, we are going to have different uh, mechanisms for the relaxation associated. Now, in the next slide, uh, we will try to define what is relaxation time. Okay, so now uh, if you if you look at uh, if you look at the uh, Maxwell model, which you are quite familiar with, it is characterized by a spring and a dashpot, right? So you are familiar with the uh, Maxwell model, and that's why I'm not going to get into the mathematical part associated. But I am just going to see say that in a Maxwell model, the relaxation time is calculated as the ratio of viscosity uh, eta by g, basically. Right. So what is this relaxation time? How do I define it? It controls the time taken for the stresses to relax. So basically, we were talking about a constant strain experiment, right? I apply a constant strain, which is nothing but by epsilon naught. And now if you monitor the stress, if you monitor the stress, this is how the stress is going to relax. It can have uh, different modes. So this is how, let's, uh, let's just assume that this is how the stresses are going to relax. So depending on whether it's a viscoelastic solid or a fluid, it might come to zero or it may not come to zero. So this is the variation of my stress. So this relaxation time controls the time taken for the stresses to relax. Okay. So this is calculated basically when constant strain is applied to the material. Okay. This is applicable when you do a constant strain experiment. Now, what happens to this relaxation time for a purely elastic material? For an elastic material, uh, the uh, if you apply a constant strain, the stress is also going to remain constant. It is not going to relax because it's a purely elastic material. right? So, uh, we define the relaxation time as the time taken for the stresses to relax. But here, we see that there is no relaxation at all. So, the stress is going to remain constant. And therefore, the relaxation time is infinite. Okay, so this is the uh, relaxation time associated with a purely elastic material. Now we'll come to the other end wherein we talk about a purely viscous material. So what happens in a viscous material? Once you apply a constant strain, the stress is going to re relax immediately. 
right? So the uh, time taken for the stress test to relax is almost zero. Uh, yeah, practically we might not get zero, but theoretically we can just say that it is almost zero, right? So this is the definition for uh, um, relaxation time based on a Maxwell model. Now we'll move on to the uh, we'll move on to the other one, uh, the auxiliary one, which is nothing but the retardation time. So what is this retardation time? Retardation time uh, can be explained using a Kelvin white model. Um, so we have assumed a white unit here, wherein we have the spring and the dash pot connected in uh, parallel. <clears throat> okay. This retardation time controls the rate of development of strain in a material on application of load. I'll tell you. So this is calculated when a constant stress is applied on the material. So I have my stress. I apply a constant stress sigma naught. Okay. So when I apply a constant stress, there is strain that is developed in the material. The strain increases. Again, it will reach an uh, asymptote here or it might keep increasing depending on whether it is a viscoelastic solid like or a fluid like. It exhibits a viscoelastic solid like or a fluid like behavior under those conditions. Now, um, what will happen in the case of a purely elastic material? So we all know that for a purely elastic material, when you have a constant stress, the strain is going to be there. Okay, so this is my strain value. So when you have a constant stress, the strain is also going to be constant, right? But we have defined retardation time as uh, something which controls the rate of development of a strain in the material. Right? So there is no rate of development of a strain here. So once you apply the stress, the strain is going to be there uh, and then the strain is going to remain constant. So for a purely elastic material, the retardation time is zero. Right, And for a purely viscous material, you can see the strain is just going to increase. It is just going to keep increasing. Therefore, the retardation time for a purely viscous material is infinite. Okay, so that we explain using a, a white unit and this is basically applicable when you uh, do a constant stress experiment, right? So it the, the basic understanding here is the rate of development. So this rate, right, it is controlled by the uh, retardation time and it is zero for a purely elastic material and it is infinite for a viscous material. Right, now we'll, uh, we'll move on to the generalized Maxwell model, basically to explain the uh, behavior of bitumen, uh, we use a Burgers model or a generalized Maxwell model. So what is this generalized model? We have n Maxwell elements connected in parallel. So we know what a Maxwell element is, a spring and a dash pot. So we have n number of these Maxwell elements connected in parallel. Okay, so this is the um, this is the expression for your relaxation modulus for a generalized Maxwell model. Mm, the uh, theory associated with it, I'm sure you have learned in your previous lectures. So I'm just going to go straight away with this expression and take out our interest, which is your relaxation time. Now, if I take the G of T parameter, we can see that this is corresponding to this particular isolated spring here. And we have n Maxwell elements. So for each Maxwell element, we have this expression for G of T and we have this parameter tau of K, which is eta of K by G of K, wherein uh, K is we have K number of Maxwell elements. So for each Maxwell element here, we have a particular relaxation time. This relaxation time is not going to be a constant. It is going to vary over a range. So to explain this, I have tried to uh, extract the relaxation time. I have tried to fit a Prony series to, um, uh, to uh, the uh, G prime, G double prime, nothing but the um, dynamic modulus data for bitumen and try to see how, uh, we, how we get the relaxation modes and the strength of each mode. So basically what we have done is taken a particular dynamic modulus variation, a frequency sweep data which is nothing but the variation of dynamic modulus with frequency. So we get G prime and G double prime. So this we have fitted using RIA. Uh, RIA is a software uh, which is used to basically compute the master curve for any material. Um, RIA also does a lot of additional things. One uh, information that we would get from RIA is it will automatically fit a generalized Maxwell model and a generalized Kelvin-White model. 
it will try to compute the number of relaxation modes the relaxation time associated with each mode and the strength associated with each mode so that is an output that we would get from ria so i have tried to do that to show you uh, for a frequency sweep result of bitumen how would be the uh, generalized maxwell model response so this is the discrete relaxation spectrum using a generalized maxwell model obtained for bitumen uh, for the sake of brevity i am not showing you how the experiment was done um, how the um, at what temperature it was done and all that mm, um, this is basically done at 5 or 6 temperatures from 25 to 75 at different frequencies in the range of 50 hertz to 0.1 hertz so that is the data associated with this and you can see we are getting 13 modes for this particular relaxation spectrum right so it has uh, it has used 13 maxwell elements to explain this particular response of bitumen at this temperature now if i am going to vary the temperature i am going to get a different set of uh, different uh, result maybe the mode numbers would vary the mode strength would vary the relaxation time would vary so that is uh, understood right so for this particular case the temperature and all the other parameters that i have chosen this is the uh, response that i am getting so you can see there are 13 modes given here for each mode the strength is given and the associated relaxation time is also given now if you look at the relaxation time here you can see it varies from 1.38 into e to the power minus 10 to 2.10 e to the power plus 1 right so we have a distribution of relaxation times varying over a large range maybe over a decade or so right so uh, you can now connect to the um, uh, connect to the discussion that we had a few slides back re regarding the different uh, mechanisms responsible for relaxation and the times so there might be some mechanism which will happen quickly uh, so those are given by the smaller relaxation times some mechanism which will take a longer time and that is given by the larger relaxation times we said we have 13 maxwell elements right so we have now uh, represented those individual responses so this is g of t versus t now this is for each of those 13 elements okay so these uh, red lines that you see here right so these are the responses you can see uh, here wherein it is very short relaxation time mode 1 and you can see mode 13 which is nothing but this particular one right which is taking a longer time for the stresses to relax right so we have 13 elements right similarly we can also compute a retardation spectrum which is from a creep experiment okay so uh, from that the uh, you can see the retardation spectrum here only 12 modes are used it is a generalized kelvin model only 12 modes are used here and for each mode you can see the compliance and the retardation time right so now this if you look at this you can see this is j of t which is nothing but the creep compliance master curve again it is expressed as the cumulative result of the relaxation times associated with individual modes right now um what how how do you get this g of t right previously i was telling you that we are doing a stress relaxation experiment so what i am going to do here is apply a constant strain and i am going to monitor the uh, stress at different time intervals from the stress value i would compute g of t so now um, if you if you practically do this experiment you are going to compute data only at discrete time intervals we are not going to get a continuous data the only thing that you could do is to keep this interval as small as possible right but still it is discrete so now uh, let's say these black points are my discrete um, values which i have collected experimentally now we just join these points points and we get a continuous data so whenever we have this g of t versus t plot you should remember that this is only a discrete data and we have just fitted these discrete points to get the continuous data right so this is regarding the g of t now we will move on to the relaxation spectrum that we are interested in so basically what is this relaxation spectrum we can have a discrete relaxation spectrum or we can have a continuous relaxation spectrum so what is this discrete relaxation spectrum it is very simple uh, in this slide we have said we have different relaxation modes right so i have like 13 relaxation modes so i explain them with the time associated with it now you can see 
uh, here in this example, they have used four uh, different relaxation times. So 0 0.05, 0 0.5, 5 and 50. So this is tau 0 0.05, 0 0.5, 550. So these are my uh, discrete relaxation times. So if I have to apply, apply to our example that we were seeing, I would have 13 points like that here. Right. So this is your discrete relaxation time that you can easily relate to the uh, Maxwell model elements. Now, if I try to, uh, if I try to, you know, like obtain a continuous spectrum for this, this is how it will look like, right? The peak will be associated with wherever we are having the discrete relaxation times. And then it is not a single point, but it is continuous like this, the green line that you see here, right? So for the same case, this is how a continuous relaxation spectrum will look like. Okay, so if you look at literature, people have tried to compute both discrete and continuous relaxation spectrum. Now, when you analyze the data, when you try to extract the relaxation times from the data, basically, first we will end up in con computing a continuous relaxation spectrum. I'll tell you how we do it. It is based on how we define G of T. So the first thing that we would get is a continuous relaxation spectrum. Then it is approximated to a discrete relaxation spectrum. Uh, sometimes what happens is during this approximation, there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of approximations that we do when we try to com uh, compute a discrete relaxation spectrum from a continuous relaxation spectrum. So that is why uh, in literature, people suggest to go with the continuous relaxation spectrum rather than using a lot of approximations to compute the discrete relaxation spectrum. Right. So uh, if you have four modes or four prominent relaxation times, this is how you will get. If I have two prominent relaxation times, I will get only two peaks here. Okay, so this is how we interpret a continuous relaxation time spectrum. And you should remember that it is a plot of H of tau, the continuous one, which is nothing but uh, this value versus tau, which is nothing but the relaxation time. Right. Now, we will get into the algorithm which is used for estimation of relaxation spectrum. Uh, I am going to show you some data shortly. Uh, which we have computed from stress relaxation experiment. So this is the procedure associated with computation of the relaxation spectrum. So what is the algorithm? First thing is G of Ti. Ti is nothing but the time at which I am calculating the uh, G of T value. So if I do an experiment for 600 seconds, maybe uh, let's assume that I am collecting data for every one second. So uh, I would have 600 data points. So the G of T value and the corresponding TI value are the input data here. The uh, number of modes that, that is associated here is computed automatically. Uh, this particular routine is from a computer program, which is given by Take and Schanberg. So they have developed a routine and a, the associated code to compute relaxation spectrum from uh, your dynamic modulus data or stress relaxation experiment. So basically, we are trying to use the routine uh, to compute the relaxation spectrum. And I am explaining the routine which is associated with that. Now, if you take this uh, G of T and Ti data, the number of modes to explain this G of T behavior is determined automatically. Okay, there is some optimization which is done to compute in. We'll come back to that. Now, this continuous relaxation is calculated first, and then only it is discretized, like I had, I had told you before. So how do we compute it? So this is explained using this function. We have G of T, which is integration from minus infinity to infinity, H of tau, e to the power minus T by tau, D ln tau. This is the function that we use to explain G of T in terms of its relaxation spectrum. And here you should remember that this H of tau is explained as e to the power capital H of tau. Uh, why do we use this approximation? Basically, when you use this approximation, it makes this problem nonlinear. In fact, it complicates it. But still, we are using this approximation because uh, we are interested in avoiding negative values for H of tau. We know that it is a relaxation time. And it is not possible to have negative values for relaxation time. So that is why uh, this approximation is used here. Right. So this is our G of T expression. And you should remember that this H of tau is nothing but e to the power capital H of tau. The next thing is, we are trying to identify this H of tau function that minimizes a cost function V lambda. I'll tell you what this V lambda is. Lambda here is used as a regularization parameter. Okay, don't worry about it. I'll tell you how it is done. 
Now, uh, how is this V of uh, lambda defined? We said this is a cost function, right? So this cost function is defined as the summation of two terms. The first term rho and the second term involving lambda and eta. So what is this rho here? It is the relative squared error between your experimental g of t and the fitted g of t using this particular function. Okay, so if you look at the expansion for this v of lambda, you can see there are two terms. This is my first term here, and this is the second term here. So this first term is nothing but <clears throat> the squared uh, difference between g of t i and g of i. So one is the experimental data, and the other one is the fitted data. And the second term here is the average squared curvature of the spectrum. Like maybe it, it defines how the curvature of the spectrum looks like. Okay, uh, I'll tell you again how it is done. Now we have to find an optimal lambda value based on this. That is done using this L curve method. So this is a plot which shows eta on the y axis and rho on the x axis, basically these two parameters. Now we have to find a particular lambda for which both these values are minimal. You can see as I move towards here, and you can see this is for each lambda value. We assume lambda values in the range of 10 to the power minus 7 to 10 to the power 3. Again, uh, you can have any range that you're interested in. We can have a range. We see the uh, B, uh, for each lambda value, we compute this function and we try to identify for a particular lambda value for which this V of lambda will be lesser. Basically, eta should be lesser, rho should also be lesser. Okay, so I'll explain that. Maybe two slides down, we have the procedure. So how do we start? All right, so this is the uh, uh, basic uh, principle involved here. So now let me explain the step-by-step -step procedure associated. Now we assume a range for the tau value. Right, So we can give uh, maybe 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power plus 2 or minus 3 to 3. So we can give, we can limit the range of tau. So now for each of, for in this range, tau is logarithmically divided into equispaced points. Okay, let's say I want 10 points, I want 100 points that could be defined prefixed. So this entire range tau minimum to tau maximum is divided into logarithmically equispaced points. Now, for each tau of j, t of i, and g of t of i, g of t is computed. Basically, using the expression that we had explained before. Okay, we compute g of t. Now, this process is repeated for lambda in the range of 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the power 2. Like I said, again, the range can vary. You can choose any range for this. Now, for each lambda, a routine is used to minimize v of lambda, that is, not, that is nothing but the cost function, to obtain h tau of lambda. So this is this is nothing but the, um, the, the procedure that is used to find the optimal lambda. So you can see, as you go uh, here, the row values lesser. As you go here, the row values become higher. Also, the eta values are relatively lower up to this point. So this is selected as the optimal lambda value. Now we have one lambda value that we have obtained, right? Now h of tau, uh, the h lambda of tau, previously we had calculated for each lambda value in the for lambda varying in the range of 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the power 2. Now uh, we have chosen the optimal lambda. So for that particular uh, lambda value, we compute h of tau, okay? So this is for the continuous relaxation spectrum. Now we use it in this expression and we will be getting h of tau. This is for the continuous relaxation spectrum. Now, this is first determined. Okay, From this continuous relaxation spectrum, we are trying to compute for discrete relaxation um, times. So how was this done? This is done basically by estimating the relative importance of modes. Let us say we had 13 modes in the previous example. Like I told you before, not all 13 modes are equally important. Right, The relative importance of modes would be different. So how do we estimate the relative importance of mode? So that is done using a parameter called beta, which is nothing but the relaxation, which is explained by the particular mode to the overall. This is nothing but the summation for all my n modes. Let's say we have n s modes. 
So this is I'm the summation of my um, G of T value for all the modes, and this is the G of T value for a particular mode. Right. So I estimate the relative importance. I sum it up so that I get it as my beta j, which is nothing but the relative importance of a particular mode j. Now uh, we are using another parameter called alpha here. Alpha is to identify the strength of each mode. Right. So we have we said we have multiple modes. Let's just assume we have thirteen modes. So it is going to estimate the relative importance of all these thirteen modes. Now. when we are identifying the modes greater mode density will be in the region which contributes more to my relaxation spectrum okay so it is not going to equally uh, have modes at different time intervals it's going to orient more number of modes where uh, in the region which is contributing more to my relaxation spectrum and lesser number of modes in the other region right so that is uh, the reason of computation of beta j parameter so once that is computed then the uh, tau i is fixed like where we are going to have each of the mode uh, the region uh, in which we are going to have multiple number of modes then uh, g i is obtained by solving a non negative linear least squares problem so it's nothing but a, a least squares algorithm but it is it is again a linear least squares problem Uh, wherein we should not get any negative value for g of i so we fix bounds like that and then compute compute g of i and then the optimal number of modes is iterated by using an optimization routine initially there will be some number of modes which are assumed and then it would be optimized to calculate the uh, optimal number of modes to explain this particular response right so this is the routine uh, to compute relaxation spectrum uh, based on the procedure explained by takay and shanberg and they have also uh, developed a routine using both matlab and python to execute this and compute relaxation spectrum and uh, yeah this is how you minimize error when you uh, this is the optimization routine basically you try to identify uh, the number of modes wherein you know like you have the error is minimal we can fix the error range that is acceptable acceptable to us and then choose modes accordingly so here maybe you know like 5 6 7 8 maybe 9 or 10 modes would be the optimal one for this particular case now uh, this is how a continuous and a discrete relaxation spectrum will look like the blue line here is my continuous relaxation spectrum and the black squares that are seen here are the discrete modes that are computed like this using this method we have computed and this is the discrete relaxation times associated this is g of i versus tau for the discrete case and e to the power capital h of tau versus tau for the uh, continuous case okay this is based on the stress relaxation experiment we will uh, we can do the same thing with your dynamic modulus data also so here g prime is explained like this uh, minus infinity to infinity omega square s square by 1 plus omega square s square into uh, h of s d ln s mm, s is nothing but it is tau just to uh, differentiate the discrete and continuous modes in some textbooks if you see for the continuous case instead of tau s will be used but is it is nothing but the relaxation time similarly you can see for the discrete mode also they have explained and here you can see they have used tau so from your small amplitude oscillatory shear experiment you can compute g prime and g double prime and from that you can also compute your continuous and discrete relaxation spectrum but you should have the storage and loss modulus data g star is not sufficient uh, in fact modulus of g star is not sufficient you should have g prime and g double prime data uh, variation mm, with frequency you can use that data to compute the uh, continuous and discrete relaxation spectrum in this case now uh, we'll discuss a case study uh, based on a dst project which was awarded to dr neetu roy uh, we had taken uh, different uh, binders here in india we are quite familiar that we have two types of processing methodologies air blown partial air blowing or air rectification and component blended which is a pda based material so we have procured the air blown material from vizag refinery and blended material from mumbai refinery both of them corresponding to vg30 grade so basically they are uh, binders of same grade but produced using different production processes obviously the crude source would also be different now um a modified bitumen was manufactured using these two based binders with sbs so initially a particular uh, tri block uh, 
SBS was used of a particular architecture to produce this modified bitumen. But what happened was the compatibility of the modifier was different for both the cases, right? Then uh, it was understood that each of these binders, in fact, uh, required a different type of modifier. We could not use a same type of modifier for both of these binders. So that is the first thing that we understood. It is not that uh, it is not sufficient if you look at the grade of the material, but we should also remember that um, they are from different crudes, different processes. Uh, their uh, their uh, thermal and stress history associated are completely different. So for compatibility and meeting the required uh, required specification properties, we understood that they require different type of modifiers. So two different type of modifiers was used. Uh, the dye block, which is nothing but we have a styrene butadiene. We know SBS, styrene butadiene styrene. That is nothing but a tri block, three blocks, right? A tri block was used for VR. Initially, a tri block was attempted for both the cases, but since it did not give the required uh, properties in the case of MR bitumen, tri block was used only in the case of VR bitumen. And for MR, a dye block was used, wherein we have only styrene and butadiene, right? And uh, the blending was carried out as per manufacturer's recommendations. Again, I'm not going to get into the details associated here. Now, these are the properties of the two base bitumen. If you look at the penetration at 25, 47, and 53, so we are slightly stiffer. If you look at the viscosity at 60 degree also, it is almost closer, but marginally, uh, we are stiffer. Similarly, the kinematic viscosity, but softening point, they're almost identical. And if you look at the G star by sine delta, the PG based parameter, almost identical. The aging characteristics are same. You, you can see the viscosity ratio, right? So we can say both of them are kind of similar bitumen. And for to each of these bitumen, different dosages of the modifier was added. For the VR based bitumen, dosages of 1%, 3%, and 5% SBS was added. And for the MR-based bitumen, again, 1, 3, and 5. But you should remember that this is a tri-block, whereas this is a di-block. Now, if you look at the penetration, let's say VR1 and MR1 um, marginally higher. Here you can see now MR is marginally higher. And as the dosage increases, you can see how the value varies. Right? Similarly, the softening point. Now, if you look at VR1 and MR1, they are having identical softening point values. But now if you look at the at 5% dosage, you can see VR has a softening point of 83, whereas MR has only 64, right? So uh, the physical properties are different. It varies depending on dosage, the type of base binder. So you can, um, you can read the paper for further details. The important thing that I am interested to discuss here is the uh, use of relaxation spectrum in identifying the responses exhibited by the different materials. So for that, a stress relaxation experiment was carried out. Uh, it was done at three temperatures, 50, 60, and 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, again, these temperature ranges were chosen because basically it was interested to, uh, the interest here is to capture the rutting response of different materials. So that is why the temperatures were chosen towards the higher end. And uh, this was done at different dosages. Zero is nothing but the base binder, the unmodified binder. One, one VR1 is a VR plus one percentage of SBS. VR3 is VR plus three percentage of SBS and five percentage. And the stress relaxation experiment was carried out at 25% strain, 50% strain, and 75% strain. All right, so this is the relaxation modulus uh, that was obtained. You can see they're nicely grouped in based on their uh, dosage, but there was no big difference be, uh, depending on the strain level. Right? The strain amplitude, uh, you can see here, 25, 50, and 75, almost uh, one above the other. Right? Whereas if you look at VR1, you can see here, uh, similarly, VR3. VR3 is a black line that we see here, and then you can see VR5. Uh, to to uh, understand how the stresses relax, to compare the manner in which the stresses relax for different materials, it was again normalized. Right? The starting value was kept as one, and then the relaxation modulus was normalized. And you can see here, this is 25, uh, this is VR0, 25, 50, and 75. This is VR1, again, 25, 50, 75. 
we are three and five you can see they are almost uh, identical uh, above uh, one percent um, i mean about three percent you can see there is not much of a difference in the manner in which they relax okay um, we try to compute different parameters uh, basically the time at which 50 percent of the stresses relax time at which 75 percent of the stresses relax so like that we try to use different parameters but uh, there was no big difference that we were able to identify among these dif uh, different uh, temp binders and at different temperatures right so then we were looking at additional parameters which could clearly distinguish the responses um, depending on the type of base binder that is used here and the test temperatures and then a relaxation spectrum was computed uh, before that you can also look at the uh, jnr values the uh, jnr difference and the recovery at uh, 3200 pascal stress level which is nothing but the 3.2 kilopascal stress level uh, let's let's just look at the percentage recovery. If you look at VR1, and when you compare with MR1, you can see the uh, percentage recovery is higher in the case of VR compared to MR. Similarly, you can see for 3% dosage also, recovery is higher in VR compared to MR. But now when you move on to 5% uh, SBS, you can see MR has a higher recovery compared to VR. Right, so dosage is one factor. But the influence of dosage is different on these two types of base binders. Right? To understand why all this happens, whether any new, um, any new mechanism is, contribute, uh, is identified in these cases, we computed the relaxation spectrum. So this is the continuous relaxation spectrum that we had computed. This is for an air blown material at 50 degrees Celsius. This is the relaxation spectrum. Uh, you can see, again, there was no difference based on the strain amplitude that we had used for 25%, 50%, and 75% strain levels, we could see this relaxation spectrum. It was exactly on top of each other. So based on the strain, we did not see any difference. And uh, so further, we are not going to consider the influence of strain. Now, when we look at the uh, effect of dosage, you can see the black line here. This is uh, the base binder, PR base binder. As we add 1% dosage, the red line you can see, the black one had two peaks, right? It was a bimodal relaxation spectrum. We had only two prominent peaks here. The red one, when you add a modifier also, we saw that uh, we had only two peaks. So basically, there is no new relaxation time that is, um, um, that is identified because of the addition of modifier. At least for the conditions that we had studied, there is no new peak arising because of the addition of the modifier. Now, this is the red line here for 1% dosage. You can see 3%. Um, this is also uh, having only two peaks, similarly 5%. But one difference that we could see is the shifting of the peak. The already existing peak was present, but it is shifted to higher relaxation times. So basically, we said the relaxation time is infinite for an elastic material. So as it moves towards higher relaxation times, we see that the material is behaving like a more elastic kind of a material. So that was one observation that we were able to uh, obtain from this. Uh, this is for an air blown material at 50 degree. Similarly, we have the results for blended bitumen at 50 degrees Celsius. So here you can see the 0%, 1%. And you can see the 3% is here, whereas the 5% is, is behaving differently, right? So the effect of dosage is not the same on both the base binders as we had explained before. Then we had computed certain parameters from the relaxation spectrum. One is the location of the peak. So how basically this peak, right, it shifts um, with increase in dosage or with increase in temperature. We had uh, monitored the location of peak one and peak two, right? And then um, the mean and standard deviation was also computed from different trials. So this is the result. You can see as the dosage increases, it is shifting towards the right or higher relaxation times. And you can see that um, the shift is uh, more prominent in the case of peak two compared to peak one, but still we cannot associate what contributes to the peak one, what contributes to the peak two. So that we are not still able to understand. If you also look at the effect of temperature, you can see this is um, this is the peak at 
50 degrees point not two three. Let us take it for uh, um, 60 degrees point not one five. Let us take it for 70 degrees point not not six. Right, so this is basically shifting towards the left as the temperature increases, indicating a more viscous kind of a behavior, which is expected. And we also computed the temperature uh, sensitivity of these peaks based on these values. And we were uh, able to see that these parameters captured the temperature sensitivity more effectively compared to any parameter that we computed directly from the relaxation modulus. The relaxation modulus at different time or the time taken for 50% of the stresses to relax or time taken for 75% of the stresses to relax. None of these parameters were able to clearly distinguish the temperature sensitivity of uh, different dosages and different types of base binders, but we were able to obtain that clearly from the uh, location of the peaks uh, at different temperatures and dosages. Uh, in fact, you can uh, read the paper for further details as well. Right, so that is when we understood this relaxation spectrum has a lot of information that we could not, uh, we will not be able to get from straightforward analysis of any of the rheological response. So to summarize, relaxation time is a fundamental parameter to characterize the material response. For bitumen, basically we use a generalized Maxwell model, which is called is also called as a Prony series, to capture the individual relaxation modes. We said multiple relaxation modes are possible. Even for a single constituent material, we said that it can have multiple relaxation mechanisms. So bitumen has multiple constituents and each has multiple mechanisms. But from the relaxation spectrum, we are able to see that it is mostly a bimodal relaxation that we see for bitumen, basically two prominent modes. We could have hundreds of other modes, but at a lower level. So that is why it is not picked up in this relaxation spectrum. And uh, we have also seen that it is effectively used to characterize the response of binders and mixtures. Um, basically, I have not shown you any mixture data, but research, uh, research is currently undergoing related to use of this relaxation spectrum for mixtures as well. Uh, so it is sensitive to the effect of modification, variation in polymer dosage, and many other parameters uh, as far as mixture is concerned. Right? So, so that is all I have related to the relaxation spectrum. Thank you for your time.